Hey y'all, it's Jonathan and I'm back with another video and I know it's been a while. I appreciate all of the love, the comments that I got on my last video, um, my review of Little Rock by Akweke Amezi. Um, it really felt amazing to come back after 10 months of not uploading videos and receive such positive feedback and to see that people actually missed my presence on booktube so i just want to thank y'all now since i have been gone for so long i have a lot of books that i have read and have not reviewed and so i thought that kind of coming back i would do my backlog of reviews and talk about all the books that i've read for the past 10 months and so i think that i'm going to break these up into three videos this one is going to be all of the literary fiction that I have read, then I'm going to do all of the romances that I have read, and then the YA middle grade children's lit that I have read over the past 10 months. So if you're interested in knowing my thoughts on all of the literary fiction that I have read over the past 10 months, keep on watching and let's get right into this. Okay, so just a disclaimer, I did read a lot of these or listen to a lot of these books via audio. And that is because these past, while I've been gone, a lot has been going on. Life has been lifing, I've been busy, work has been wild. And so when I get home or when I have like a minute of time, I'm not sitting down and reading a physical copy of a book. So I have chosen to listen to a lot of books on audio. Sometimes listening to books on audio can change the experience. It can alter how you feel about a book. Sometimes you have good audiobook narrators, sometimes you don't. And so if y'all felt a different way about a book, maybe you read it physically, let me know in the comment section. That is definitely a conversation that we can have. But um, I will say I read some very, very interesting books. So let's get right into this and get started. So the first book that I want to talk about was Lush Lies by J. Vanessa Lyon. And the synopsis reads, for Glory Hopkins, inheriting her aunt Lucille's Harlem Brownstone feels more like a curse than a blessing. As a restless artist struggling to find gallery representation, Glory doesn't have the money, time, or patience to look after the aging house of an aunt she barely knew. But when she stumbles into Parky to Groot, a savvy, ambitious auction house appraiser on the verge of a coveted promotion, her unexpected inheritance begins to look more promising. Glory and Parky form an unlikely alliance and work to unearth the origins of a rare manuscript hidden in the brownstone's trove. In doing so, they, under they uncover not only the well-kept secrets of Lucille's life, but also the complex relationships between Harlem and its undistinguished residents. And so I think that the premise of this novel, the description that you get, it doesn't even like fully encompass how this novel feels when you're reading it. I think that all of those details are very important. This novel does focus a lot on just understanding people, understanding humanity, understanding relationships, understanding romance, the complexities of romance and relationships. And I think that you get a very slow burning novel and you really have to, you really have to go into this novel with an open mind. You have to go into this novel relaxed because I think that this novel is very slow paced. I think that it's not some like like fast paced romance with like all of the tropes that you love. I think that it's very complex and I think that the characters are interesting. I think that the characters are complex and you know like Parky is disabled and this book tackles that but it also tackles Parky's whiteness that in comparison to Glory as a black queer woman and so you get all those complexities and it really is overall a very beautiful novel and I think towards the end it definitely does pick up um you get a lot of that like conflict um but I really, really love this novel and I have suggested it to a lot of people. I think that I, it didn't necessarily click as much that this would be a, a queer romance of sorts, but um, I think that that romance element of it 
kind of takes a back seat to just like you know the a, a character glory being on this journey to self-discovery and so that's why i didn't put it in my romance category but i think you definitely could toss it in there but it's not your typical romance um so yeah i really really appre appreciated it and i think that everybody should check out lush live so after that i read a book that i actually do have a physical copy of and i had actually found this um at a bookstore when i was in phoenix arizona and it's second time around by James Earl Hardy. And if y'all have watched my review of B-Boy Blues um, and along with my review of the film, you probably know how I feel about B-Boy Blues. Um, I read this also with my uh, the book club that I moderate, the Brothers in Unity book club. And we all felt a variety of different ways about B-Boy Blues. Um, it is a complicated novel. I think that because it is very 90s and so i think that black queer men particularly in the 90s there was so much going on and and you know ideas of like what black relate the relationships between two black men looks like were very like there were a lot of different voices sort of form forming that that image you know, and there were a lot of different like political things going on that were informing how black queer men wanted to navigate their relationships. And I think that you do see a lot of like those gender roles and political ideas present in this novel um, because you get, you, so essentially Raheem and Mitchell are back, AKA Pookie and Lil Bit and you really just see like a t very toxic relationship y'all that relationship is toxic the relationship is a mess it's full of like these very conflicting ideas that each one of these characters has about what masculinity looks like what blackness looks like what being a black man looks like um and then what being in a relationship with another black man looks like and so this in particular is very heavy on Raheem's perspective and Raheem is young and Raheem Raheem is not the brightest and you see a lot of like his toxic ideas um you know really harmful ideas that honestly hurt um that hurt, wind up hurting Mitchell very present in this novel and so I think that it's it's always interesting to read these books it's like how I feel when I'm reading Elon Harris's novels so um it's always interesting reading that um so i think that as a sequel if you enjoy b-boy blues definitely check this out do i think that if you enjoy that if you didn't enjoy b-boy blues you would want to read second time around absolutely not um but i think that i want to read more of james earl hardy's work um because these are the books that i love um but there are definitely guilty pleasures. There's those, there are those books that I got pick up and read on like a hot summer day, or like I'll pick up like late at night when I want something to read. Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting. It's definitely leaves a lot of room for discussion, um, especially if you have like a book club with other black queer men. So definitely um, check this out if you've read B-Boy Blues and you enjoyed it. So, uh, next up is Family Meal by Brian Washington. And this was one of my most anticipated books because if you have, <laughs> if you have been following this channel and subscribed for a minute, you know that I love Memorial. You know that I really, really loved a lot Brian Washington's collection of short stories. And so I was really, really anticipating this novel, especially especially since like Brian, Ta Brian Washington's writing, it, it, it's, it's so lovely in the descriptions of food and the comfort of food in his work and the way that he writes about and sort of like intertwines a lot of Asian American and Black American culture and the connections between those communities. Um, in his work, it always, it always does something to me. Um, and so I think that I've, I've reflected on this novel a lot, but in my initial review, um, I kind of kicked it off by uh, 
pointing out a quote that really stuck with me because all there's always like quotes that stick with me with books and it was it's our responsibility to care for each other um and i think that family meal is a really beautiful exploration of grief family and food and i think that you see that a lot across brian washington's work um cam is a black queer man um, who is grieving and sort of spiraling after the death of his partner. And Cam's former best friend um, is also someone that he has lost around the same time. And so Family Meal really forces us to see the importance of other people in our lives. I think that you seeing the way that the grief, losing an intimate partner and then also losing a friend and the way that that can affect you and sort of having those people back in your life um, or the journey to having those people back in your life, how that can drastically change you is really, really beautiful. Um, because we can't exist in isolation. And I think that that's something that I've had to realize and I think the pandemic taught a lot of us, like how much it hurts to like not be able to be around people. And so I think that Cam and TJ both learn this um, about their own uh, their own friendship, about their own relationships with the people in their lives. I really, really love Cam's narrative. And I think that we didn't get as much of Cam's narrative in the novel. Um, his relationship with Kai really made me tear up. And when you actually do learn about like what happened to Kai, you know, I think that that, that broke me. Like this, that, that was like the toughest part of this novel, finding that out. And you definitely, I think going into this, you need to know that it is very much so a pandemic novel. Um, it, it, the, the actual events that happen in the novel take place like as the world is opening back up. And so you see like, you know, how like gay bars are empty and you know, people are recovering, their businesses are recovering and people are recovering emotionally. And so I think that at the time that I read this, it was a slow read. It took me a while to get through it, particularly because of that heaviness of the looming um, pandemic at the time. And, you know, as the world has like opened back up, I think that um, I'm going to want to read this book again. And, you know, maybe I will be a little bit more comfortable reading. I've avoided a lot of those like quote unquote pandemic novels. Um, I think that this book needed a lot more of Cam. To me, TJ is not as compelling of a character. He bored me in a way that I wasn't really expecting. Um, there are a lot of elements of the story that I did want to learn more about um, that we didn't get much of until the end. And I honestly really did not care about TJ's love life in the slightest. Um, and we did get one chapter that was from the perspective of Kai's ghost. And that was heart-wrenching. Um, so I do think that this novel is worth the read. I think I wound up giving it like a 3.5 out of 5 stars, but I, I marked it as a 4 um, on Goodreads. So um, if you enjoy Brian Washington's work, definitely check out Family Meal. So next up is uh, Fat Ham, which is a stage, played, stage play written by uh, James I. James. And this one was super, super interesting because of the fact that it was a stage play. And so I listened to it on audio, uh, which was a really, really great experience. And Fat Ham is, a, is an adaption of Hamlet by Shakespeare. And so essentially the premise of the novel is Juicy, a young queer black man is confronted by the ghost of his father during a cookout who demands that Juicy avenges his murder. Juicy, already familiar with Hamlet's plight, tries to break the cycle of trauma and violence. So all of this takes place at a cookout and you know, like Juicy is dealing with his mother and her new boyfriend who's also the pastor of the church and cousins and people within the community. And it's like a really, really fascinating play. And I would love to see it um, if it ever is put back on stage. So, you know, I love stage plays. I did theater in high school. And so it's always like had a piece of my heart. And so especially like black queer stage plays, like. Um, Choir Boy um, by Terrell McCraney. When I listened to that, on, when I actually read that screenplay, oh, 
I fell in love with it. And so this is one of the types of literature that I want to read more of. And so if anybody has any more information about Fat Ham and like if it's ever like coming to Ohio, <laughs> let me know. I definitely want to see it on the stage. So I did a really quick review of this on uh, on Instagram, but I never did an actual video review of this, which is ours by Philip B. Williams. Um, and what was actually really cool was that I had the chance to meet Philip B. Williams um, at a book conference that I was on a panel for. And it was a really, really great experience um, meeting him and then also then anticipating this novel. And I had received an advanced review copy that I had left at home, not even thinking about the fact that I might run into him. So I didn't get it signed. Hopefully eventually I can get it signed. But um, ours came out a few months ago um, and this is, let me just read the synopsis. In this ingenious sweeping novel, Philip B. Williams introduces us to an enig enigmatic woman named Saint, a fearsome conjurer who in the 1830s annihilates plantations all over Arkansas to rescue the people enslaved there. She brings those that she freed to a haven of her own creation, a town just north of St. Louis, magically concealed from outsiders named ours. It is in this miraculous place that Saint's grand experiment, a truly secluded community where her people may flourish, takes root. But although Saint does her best to protect the inhabitants of ours, over time, her conjuring and memories began to portray her, leaving the town vulnerable to intrusions by newcomers with powers of their own. As the cracks in Saint's creation are exposed, some begin to wonder whether the community's safe, safety might be yet another form of bondage. And so I think that this novel was like genius. I think that um, it's taking place in the 1830s, this like free town, uh, this free town of black people that you sort of see um, in like Zora Neale Hurston's work. And, um, but, it, but otherwise is like very rarely explored. Um, I think that that is always something that is very, very fascinating, you know, where you get like um, Africa town and you get um, towns like Eatonville. And, um, you know, so I think that it's, I think that it's always, always interesting to see literature that explores the sort of like those last couple of decades of enslavement. Um, of chattel slavery in the United States um, that explore what freedom means to black people, especially as slavery is coming to, chattel slavery is coming to an end. And you know, black, black people having to figure out what exactly life looks like not being enslaved on a plantation. Um, and so I think that that whole idea of freedom, like freedom, Freedom is something that I think that all of my favorite authors tackle in their work. Um, and I love the the magical realism in this novel. Um, I love the, the characters in this novel. Um, and I don't even, it's, it's one of those novels where you don't necessarily know like whose side you're on. Um, and so you get like all of these various different stories of these characters in the town of ours and um, and them sort of like having differing opinions on how things should be done. And, and Saint as a character, this very complex black woman who has like freed all of these people, but then has to figure out what her role is um, and this urge to protect people, but then also letting them sort of like figure things out for themselves. So ours was an absolutely fascinating novel um, that I really, really loved. And I think it's worth the read, y'all. It's, th it's a thick one. It's a thick one, but it's definitely worth the read. So um, the next up is a book that uh, was also a part of my book club, the Black and Love Book Club uh, that I run at Prologue Bookshop. And this was a Good Women Stories by Hal Hill. And um, in her dynamic debut, Hal Hill's Good Women delves into the lives of 12 black women across the Appalachian South. A woman boards a Greyhound bus barreling towards Florida to meet her sugar daddy's mother. A state fair employee considers revenge on a local preacher. A sister struggles with guilt as she helps her brother plan to run away with a man he's seeing in secret. A young woman who works for a scam for profit college navigates the lies she's selling for a living. 
darkly funny and deeply human good women observes how place blood ties generational trauma obsession and boundaries or lack thereof influence how we navigate our small world and how those worlds so often collide in ways we don't expect and so this novel reminded me a lot of the secret lives of church ladies by disha phil y'all and that is she actually did a blurb on the front of this book which is why i picked it and we read this around like thanksgiving of last year and y'all i love short story collections where people are making interesting iffy questionable decisions it always does something for me and so good women is entertaining it's uh it's brutal at points but i appreciate all of the perspectives um, because I think that short story collections, they offer you just enough. Um, and so it causes you to think a lot about how these own, these people, these small glimpses at somebody's life, somebody's situation, how that actually can relate to your own life and the own decisions that you're making. And so um, I really, really enjoy Good Women by Hal Hill. <sighs> now this next one, this next one was a tough read. Um, it was phenomenal and I can't stop thinking about it. I read Don't Cry For Me by Daniel Black and this is a book that everybody talks about. I don't know how I was so late to this, um, but Don't Cry For Me by Daniel Black. It is about a black father trying to make amends with his son. Jacob in the novel is um, dying of cancer and he is not seeking treatment he literally is just letting himself uh, wither away. And in, in this moment, he has made the decision to write these letters to his gay son, his estranged gay son. I don't wanna give too many details of the book because I, I think that that's what you gotta read it for. It connected with me so deeply because um, you know, being a queer black man, I think that you you always have like a complex relationship with your father for the most part, you know, being like black men. And I I think that very rarely we get in-depth looks at what that relationship actually looks like, the complexity of that relationship, what they look like. We get like those brutal moments on like a show like Empire where somebody, where he tosses his son into the trash can or you get, you know, the ones where they kick him out of the house and all these various different things like that. but. Growing up in a household with a black father as a queer black man is a very unique experience. And so many elements of this novel um, hit a little bit differently because Jacob is from the South. Uh, my own father is from the South. He's from Alabama. My, uh, my father's side of the family is from Alabama. I spent a lot of time down there um, in my childhood. Um, my father was also raised by his grandmother, uh, which you you see that <laughs> in this novel. My father was also diagnosed with um, prostate cancer um, a few years ago, and dealing with that and navigating that, and sort of like the year since, um, you know, especially as I have, you know, opened the doors and and been a lot more open and unabashed about my sexuality and navigating that relationship. Reading a book where you seeing all of this on the page and seeing a father trying to explain himself, a black father trying to explain himself, it hits hard. And it leaves you in a place where you're like, you, you're not even necessarily judging Jacob, you're just seeing the reality of the situation and just hoping that other people reading this novel, things will change and that, you know, black men can heal and seek help and, you know, get what they need to be able to not continue this cycle of like this sort of, this fracture in the relationships between um, black fathers and their queer sons. And so this novel hit differently and I think every black man should read it. I think every black man should read it. My little brother read it. And it was so crazy because we read it around the same time. Um, and me and him had a conversation about this book. 
I was like, I'm gonna send this to my dad. <laughs> so we'll see if that happens. But yeah, this book hit different. Hit really different. Um, and I think that appropriately, the last book that I will talk about is something that's not gonna take a lot of time because it's, it's already 25 minutes uh, on this video timer. Um, but Little Rap by Kweke Mezzi, um, I did a review of their book on my channel. It's the first book that I came, the first review that I came back with. So definitely go check that out because I love this novel. If you have anything negative to say, put it under the comments in that video and I will respond. So um, yeah, definitely go check out that video and let me know what y'all have been reading otherwise. Um, I'm interested to hear, have y'all picked up any of these books? What were your thoughts? And we can have a great discussion. Um, I also, I'm going to be doing a Q and A um, after I'm done with this series. So be on the lookout for that post on social media. I'll probably also post it in the community tab on here so y'all can send me questions. We can do a little Q&A. Y'all, I'm at like 4,500 subscribers. I don't know what y'all were doing, what videos y'all were watching while I was gone. Um, but I really do appreciate all the love and the support. And I'll catch y'all in the next one. And always remember that you are loved.